What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence YouTube channel. Uh, this is episode one in a series that will be a introduction to equity investment, specifically from the lens of technical analysis, growth investment, and then kind of the overlap of those areas with the world of crypto, um, you know, into crypto exposed equities. So to start us off, I wanted to remind everyone that none of the information in this series is investment advice. I'm not a certified financial advisor. Um, nobody should pursue any investment strategy without taking due care and conducting, you know, your own proper due diligence. So, you know, to begin, who am I? My name is Blake Davis. I'm a 21 year old crypto equity analyst here at Blockware Solutions. If you're a subscriber to the newsletter, you've read some of my work. I write the general market update and the crypto equity section each week. Um, you know, my background is in technical analysis and growth investment. You know, that's been the focus of my work for the past few years. So I thought I would, you know, include some of my personal biggest investment influences. And those are Bill O'Neill, Jesse Livermore, Nicholas Starvis, and Jim Ropel. I think it's important to share that because it kind of dictates how I view the market. Um, and if you know who those people are, it might give you an idea of, you know, the kind of investor that I am. Uh, if you don't know who those people are, I, you know, recommend learning about them because I think, you know, there's a lot of lessons there to be learned. Um, so, you know, this episode specifically, you know, maybe the next episode um, will be very introductory. I just want to you know, kind of introduce some of the, you know, biggest principles of investing that, you know, beginners really need to nail down before, you know, we really get into the, you know, meat and potatoes of investment. You know, I also wanted to mention that nobody can teach you experience. It would take hours and hours of me explaining every nuance of the market. And honestly, three fourths of what you need to know, you can only learn by doing. Um, and you can start with no money in the market, just watching the market. But honestly, I think just watching the market or even paper trading, which you know is trading with make-believe money, uh, doesn't really do that much for you in the long run, because as we'll get in, uh, get into here in a second, that, you know, investing is, is very emotional. And by not using actual money, you're removing most of that emotion uh, from the table. So in the end, you're probably not going to learn a whole lot. Um, and, you know, the investing learning curve is something that I think is really interesting, too, is that, you know, most people start off not really knowing anything, you just, you know, invest how you think you should invest, uh, trade how you think you should trade. And chances are you spend, you know, a year, two, three, five years unprofitable, losing money every year. Um, that is until, you know, you hear about some investment system, some way of viewing the market um, that, you know, maybe a friend found success with, you know, someone on YouTube, someone on Twitter found success with. And then you start to implement some of those principles into your own investing until you're profitable. So, you know, building a system is really important. And, you know, most of those systems come through investment books. Traditionally, I, I think, you know, nowadays, you know, you can learn a whole investment system through YouTube probably, but I think books are the best way to do it personally. So I've included some of my uh, favorite investment books that I used to learn investing. Uh, those are on the right hand side there. So, you know, not all those are investment textbooks per se that, you know, are teaching you, you know, every little thing you need to know. A lot of them are personal stories or the stories of, you know, several different fund managers or, or you know, there's all kinds of all kinds of things there in those books. And those are just my personal favorites. There's obviously a million books out there that are about investment. Um, but those are the ones that I've personally found uh, to be my favorite. So what these books do is they provide you with a system. A lot of them do provide you with a system. Um, you know, and that's a way of viewing the market. And what it does is it, it gives you an edge. So what's an edge? Um, an edge is literally any scenario where the likelihood of one thing happening is greater than the likelihood of another thing happening. And the most one of the most common edges in the market is called technical analysis. So what is technical analysis? Um, you know, the dictionary Google definition is that technical analysis is the study of prices to identify patterns and trends to help you formulate investing decisions. Um, and, you know, this is definitely true. Um, but, you know, the reality, of it, the reality of it is a little more complicated in that is that you know technical analysis is really the study of human psychology and also supply and demand, which you know combines to be displayed as price data on a stocks chart. So you know technical uh, analysis you know isn't a perfect science. It isn't a guaranteed way to predict the future. Like you'll hear people say, you know, no one has the magic crystal ball. You know, no one can read the future. But what it does do is it provides us with 
an edge, a most likely scenario, which is based on historical precedent. So technical analysts are, are really historians. What we do is we study, you know, past winning stocks or, or assets that, you know, that have, you know, returned amazingly in the past. And, you know, you study the chart to find, you know, areas where you could have entered that gave you the best risk to reward ratio. And that is, you know, you would have been risking the least amount of money to gain the most amount of money. Um, and also, you know, it's not just about entries. It's also, you know, where the biggest winning stocks of all time started to show signs that they were tired, you know, they were done with their run. Um, there's, you know, there's a million things we study um, based off history, but historical precedent is going to be super important. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned, it's about, it's about, it's all about risk. So what TA really does or technical analysis really does is it helps investors define and manage our risk. Um, which is really name of the game uh, in investing is about you know living to fight another day more than it is about making as much money. Um, so to start off, I thought it would be important to touch on the concepts um, behind basic market psychology, um, which is super important in technical analysis. In that you know there, there's two main emotions that really guard guide the uh, decision making of most market participants, and those are fear and greed. Fear and greed go both ways. So let's say you make a buy and you're immediately, you know, green on your buy. You're immediately making money. You're fearful of round tripping that. You're fearful of, you know, the losing all of your gain or, you know, potentially going negative in your on your buy. Um, you know, at the same time, you get greedy, right? You, you're you're making money. You want to make even more money. Um, now, on the flip side, if you make a buy and you know you're negative, uh, you know, you're down on the trade. You're fearful of losing even more money. Um, and also you could get greedy and, you know, maybe you add to a losing position, you know, you buy more, uh, which is what we call averaging down, um, which by the way, is like one of the most dangerous things you can do in the market. Um, but you know, in any of those four situations, I just listed off listening to your emotions is, you know, most likely going to really, really hurt you. Um, so what you'll hear is that, you know, the goal of technical analysis is unemotional trading, right? You'll hear it from everyone online, you know, unemotional this, unemotional that, um, but why? I think the short answer is that the market doesn't care about you or your opinion, right? Um, you know, you hoping, oh, I hope the stock starts to go up or I hope the stock goes up for forever um, really doesn't matter to the market, right? That, that hope that is a, you know, by definition in emotional, um, you know, statements um, can, can really hurt you. And what they do is they entice you to fight the trend, which uh, we'll get into a little bit more, I think in the next episode, but um, you know, just for now, just remember, we never fight the trend. You know, um, technical analysis really only works because human emotions never change over time. Um, you know, I, 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 I mentioned that I study the work of Jesse Livermore, who was a trader in the 1900s, early 1910s, 1920s. Um, and a lot of his principles, you know, still stand true today, um, which we can maybe get into in future videos. But, you know, human emotions never change over time. So, you know, all these, you know, big areas of technical analysis, which, you know, support and resistance indicators, price patterns, all these things work because it's human psychology and human psychology never changes. Um, another thing I thought I, I thought was worth, worth mentioning is called Descartes' error, um, which basically tells us that it is impossible to reason or, you know, make decisions without emotion. Um, which is very true. Um, you know, every market participant is emotional and, you know, trading algorithms make up arguably like the vast majority of uh, trading volume each day. But, you know, these algorithms are written and built by, you know, very biased and emotional humans. So, you know, what we do as, you know, traders and investors and technical analysts is we learn strategies to help us ignore our emotions. So it's different for every person. So it's a lot of trial and error. Um, but in the end, all we're doing is we're looking for strategies that help us ignore our emotions and make decisions solely off of hard data that we see, you know, in front of us in the charts. So on the right hand side, I just included, um, you know, this is a pretty uh, common picture. You'll see this around on Twitter a bunch. Um, just kind of gives you, you know, a visualization of, you know, some of the, you know, emotions, some of the fear and greed, levels of fear and greed that we see, you know, in different stages of a market cycle. Um, and this isn't, you know, a total you know, super accurate, you know, that red line isn't totally accurate of every market cycle or every bubble, but um, it's just interesting to see, you know, kind of some of the emotions that people feel uh, through different stages. So next, just a little bit about price action and price action is just price movements. Um, 
the number one rule, I think, if you're going to take one thing away from this is that price is king. Um, price is king because it's the only thing that pays, right? Um, you can have the best fundamental story in the world, um, but if the market isn't reflecting that, if price isn't going up, you're not making any money, so you're not any better off. Um, you know, fundamentals are, I think, are super important. Um, you know, I don't, but I would, I would value fundamentals at about, you know, 10 to 20% of the time I spend in the market. That other 80 to 90% would be uh, on technicals. And, you know, some people are different, you know, a value investor would probably be, you know, 90% fundamentals. Um, some of my biggest investment influences like Bill O'Neill would say it's about 30% fundamentals. But, you know, I think that in the end, you know, price is king. So fundamentals, you know, kind of take the back seat and that, you know, they, maybe they'll put you in the right place. Um, you know, they'll tell you the right group to be in. They might tell you some of the leading stocks to be in, but in reality, technical, technical analysis is going to give you the entries to those stock that, provide, you know, the, op the opportunity to make the most amount of money with the least amount of risk. Um, so like va value metrics, like, you know, a PE ratio or, you know, DCF discount cash flows, um, you know, those have some use over the long term and some value over the long term for sure. Like overvalued stocks do tend to come into fair valuations over the long term. Um, but it's just not my personal style. I value price action over everything else. Um, and what we do is we base our decision making on historical precedent, right, which I've mentioned before, and this allows us to remove our emotions from decision making and solely focus on the price data. Another thing that I think is super important that I think everyone kind of needs to get through their head, you know, write down is that the market is never wrong and opinions often are, or, you know, usually are. So, you know, a common thing you hear online is, you know, you bought some stock that's, you know, 80, 90% off its highs. It's been in a downtrend for years. Uh, you know, price, the price is probably less than $10, meaning there's no liquidity for a big institution to buy a position. Um, and you say, you know, you know, I hope, you know, one day this will go up. Like, this is such a good story. You know, one day it's got to go up. And what you're saying is, you know, I think I'm right. And, you know, one day maybe the market will realize it, um, which is super flawed logic because the market knows, like the market knows all, right? You, you, chances are you're not the first person that's ever looked at this stock before, right? Um, so, you know, it's just this idea of that the market is never wrong and stocks are priced exactly where supply and demand says they're priced. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a cool O'Neill quote that talks about this a bit. And he says, uh, you can't buy a Mercedes for the same price as a Chevrolet and you can't buy oceanfront property for the same price you pay for land a couple miles inland. Everything sells for about what it's worth at the time based on the law of supply and demand. And I think that last sentence is super important and it personally totally changed my investing in my trading once I really got that through my head is that, you know, the market's never wrong and your opinion probably is. Um, so yeah, that's about all I got. So just to conclude, um, you know, I just want to remind everyone again, you know, this is just some of the very fundamental basic ideas of technical analysis. Uh, in the future, we'll get a little bit more in depth um, into the meat and potatoes of, of technical analysis, but this is just an introductory episode. So some of the key takeaways are that, you know, time in the market, but, you know, in reality, money in the market is the only way to learn pretty much, um, you know, and that technical analysis is a lot more than, you know, trend lines and indicators uh, and support and resistance. It's, it's about human psychology and it's also about supply and demand, which play out in real time. And then we can learn to, you know, read a price chart to tell us, you know, what is the current psychology of you know, the majority of market participants and, you know, where, you know, what stocks have the greatest demand and, you know, the least amount of supply. So, you know, also, like I said, you know, the golden rule of investment is that price pays and therefore, you know, price is king. So yeah, that's all I got. Um, if you like the video, you know, leave a like, if you have any feedback for me or anything you'd like me to cover in future videos, uh, feel free to leave a comment, but that's all I got. So thank you all for watching.